Hello and welcome. This is Mouse Gunner, and we're back with some more automation, the car company tycoon game. Continuing on with the campaign roleplay of the Edison Car Company in 1996. And in this video, I'm going to showcase a brand new model for the Edison Car Company, the Edison Nebula, which is an SUV and the first SUV that the Edison Car Company has produced. Now, this is the mid 90s, which is going to be the beginnings of the popularity of the SUV in the U.S. market. So we're meeting that demand just as it's occurring. In any case, let's start off with the uh, body selection and the chassis. So I chose the same body I used for the Asteroid pickup, just with uh, different styling. Uh, so if we go to that, I ended up going with the uh, five-door selection here, which obviously looks a lot more like an SUV. For the chassis, we have a monocoque chassis, which is different than what we had with the Asteroid. And corrosion-resistant steel is what that chassis is made out of, with a front longitudinal setup, McPherson strut in the front, and semi-trailing arm in the rear. And this is, again, a divergence from the Asteroid. Now, I actually uh, had a couple thoughts on this, uh, on what would be appropriate. And uh, in the early era of the SUV... The SUV was very much more the utility vehicle, which is what the U and the uh, SUV name stands for, Sport Utility Vehicle. And uh, it was much more utility-oriented, much more off-road oriented. But as time progressed and the SUV became more and more popular, it became more and more about an on-road vehicle rather than an off-road vehicle. So... I think we're kind of meeting that trend with the uh, rear suspension here, but I could have easily argued for a solid axle coil suspension, which would have given me a much more off-road uh, oriented uh, setup. But in this way, we gain in sportiness and drivability over what we would get with a solid axle. And the panel material is corrosion-resistant steel. As far as the styling goes, again, keeping things simple, Going with a nice green color, as I feel like that gives you a more uh, outdoorsy kind of feel. And our first trim is going to have longitudinal rear-wheel drive, although other trims that we're going to be looking at are going to use all-wheel drive, not 4x4 like what we had on the Asteroid. Let's go ahead and take a look at the engine selection. Now, these are going to be the same engines that are in the Asteroid, which is why I didn't have a separate video for making the engines for this model. So it has the same performance of 179 horsepower and 207 foot-pounds of torque that you saw in the Asteroid. All right, so let's move on to the uh, trim selection and start off with the gearbox itself. So the gearbox, all of these are going to be automatics. There are no manual transmission set up for the Nebula. And the gearbox we have is a four-speed automatic, and all four of the gears are more or less used as acceleration gears. We don't really have a economy gear that goes beyond our estimated top speed. Uh, this is going to give us a better 0 to 62 times, but hurt our overall fuel economy, but, uh, and also give us a little bit of wheel spin that uh, we could have easily gotten rid of. But uh, we do have a little bit, and I don't think that's necessarily that big of a deal. I also went with a viscous LSD, uh, which we maybe don't need so much in the V6-powered uh, variants of the uh, Nebula, but uh, once we get into the V8s, uh, that's going to be much more important, as it does help with that wheel spin. It also gives us a number of other benefits over just a normal open differential, which we can see here. Uh, first off, it helps with off-road, uh, which is something we're looking for, but it also helps with some sporiness as well. Doesn't really help so much in the drivability department, but, uh, you know, that's okay. You know, SUVs don't tend to handle as well, but honestly, we still scored really well in drivability, which is a trend we also saw with the Asteroid. I went with medium compound road tires, and just like what we had with the Asteroid, I, I could switch to hard, long-life road, but I think, again, we're going for more the on-road performance here. So I'm going to stick with the medium compound road, although just to see the difference here, we do lose out in drivability and sportiness, but we do gain uh, in off-road ability, which I don't think we have uh, shown here. Oh, no, actually, there it is. We gain in off-road ability and utility to some degree, as well as comfort. Which I'm not, I'm kind of surprised that we get comfort out of that, uh, considering that uh, you would think hard, long life road, the tires would be, you know, harder and give, uh, 
more of a bumpy ride, but uh, oh well, uh, it is what it is. Uh, so in any case, we're going to stick with medium compound road. And the uh, wheel diameter uh, is, uh, you know, a bit bigger, filling out those wheel arches and giving a little bit more comfort to the cabin. And we have 17-inch rims, and the tire width is 245 in the front and 265 in the rear, which, if I remember correctly, this is almost uh, exactly the same setup that we had with the Asteroid. I went with steel wheels, and the brakes we go with solid two-piston in the front and drums in the rear. So these are uh, this setup of the tires and the brakes is very similar to what we saw with the Asteroid. Not a whole lot of divergence here. We do have a little bit of brake fade with this vehicle. Moving along, I do have an off-road skid tray, and I wanted a little bit of off-road utility with this vehicle, which is why I selected that. But we do have, uh, you know, detrimental effects as a result. For instance, if I went to fully clad, I would gain quite a bit in fuel economy as well as top speed, but I uh, would lose out a little bit in drivability. I would gain in sportiness, and some of that has to do with the top speed. But you see stats go up and down depending on what it is but definitely we gain in off-road as far as the cooling airflow i went with my uh a little divergent from my standard of 10 above i went kind of the same route i did with the asteroid going about 20 above the required cooling and for the interior i went with seven seats I wanted to be able to cram as many passengers as I could into this vehicle. We already have vehicles that can fit five passengers, so why not bump it up to seven? I went with uh, standard interior and standard cassette in this trim, and we have power steering and ABS as standard, as well as uh, safety being standard. For the suspension, uh, I think I went with more of a normal preset with some tweaking, and uh, But I did rise up the ride height to uh, similar levels as what we saw with the Asteroid as well. And we have standard springs, gas monotube, and passive sway bars. So let's go ahead and look at the test track here. And we get a top speed of 117.6 miles an hour. We have a 0 to 62 time of 9.4 seconds, which we probably would, uh, talking about those hard long life road tires, this would probably... Oh, actually, no, it's not affected. That's interesting. We did see uh, negative effects on the 0-62 to 62 time when we were doing the asteroid, but not here. And it could be the difference in the way the weight is distribu distributed, but we do see more wheel spin. In any case, uh, coming back to the test track numbers here, let's go ahead and load up the airfield track and get our time. So our time comes in at 1 minute 38.58, which I don't think is too far off of the time we got with the uh, base asteroid. So I think a little bit slower, but I think this vehicle is a little bit heavier. So I think that makes a little bit of sense. Now, weight distribution wise, we're not nearly as front heavy because this is not a pickup truck. We don't have an empty bed in the back that isn't really weighing down the vehicle. Instead, we have uh, all of those uh, seats and uh and a passenger uh, compartment there, or passenger space, that uh, puts a lot of that weight more in the rear, so we are a little bit more even weight distribution than what we saw in the Asteroid. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into the uh, next uh, trim here, which we're going to jump into the all-wheel drive variant of the V6-powered Nebula. And starting off with the gearbox, again, we have a four-speed automatic, uh, but we have that all-wheel drive, so we had to set up the power distribution with, I, I went with a 30-70 setup. So 30% of the power goes to the front, and 70% of the power goes to the rear, so this is more a rear-powered car, but we have a little bit of the power going to the front to give us a little extra traction when we need it. Otherwise, the setup is very similar. There's probably a little bit of differences here and there. Um, but the 0 to 62 time comes in at uh, 10 seconds with a uh, miles per gallon of 15.8. And it's definitely a slowing down of the vehicle as far as 0 to 62 time goes. But one benefit of that all-wheel drive setup is that it is reducing the wheel spin down to zero, whereas before we had about 5.5%. And uh, the uh, increased 0 to 62 time is partly due to weight as well as a number of other factors. 
Now, with the wheel setup, this is more or less the same. Uh, brake setup is exactly the same as well, though we do have more brake fade, and again, increased weight is part of the reason for that. Aerodynamic setup is going to be exactly the same, as is the interior setup. The suspension is probably going to have some differences here and there because of differences in weight. And when we jump over the test track, we can see that we also have reduced top speed down to 115.3 miles an hour. Weight distribution looks to be about roughly the same, although there might be a slight difference here. But we do have a weight increase that we discussed earlier. All right, let's go ahead and get our track time and see uh, the difference uh, between uh, the all-wheel drive version versus the uh, rear-wheel drive version. So it, we definitely did uh, get a worse time here with 1 minute 40.21, which is uh, more than a second worse, uh, about a second and a half, actually more than that. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the next trim, which is the uh, V8-powered Nebula. Now, this is also going to be uh, all-wheel drive, as we'll see here in a second, with the power distribution set up. Uh, and I didn't show this earlier, but we can just show when we get to this selection that it is a, a longitudinal all-wheel drive selection. Also, we have to show the uh, V8 engine uh, as a reminder. So this is the same V8 uh, found in the Asteroid, which produces 256 horsepower and 293 foot-pounds of torque. So coming back into the trim with the gearbox, we again have a four-speed automatic. Uh, and uh, because of that all-wheel drive, as well as the viscous LSD, we do not have any wheel spin. And we have a much better 0 to 62 time of 7.5 seconds. Although the fuel economy has gone down still more to 14 miles a gallon. The tire setup has not changed. Nor has the brake setup. Although we do have more brake fade due to increased weight, which we see here. As well as... Uh, probably higher top speeds uh, that we have to deal with. The aerodynamics are also going to be a little bit different here. Again, going with about 20 above the required cooling. And we, again, have the same interior setup here. The suspension is going to differ yet again because of the dynamics of the difference in weight. And let's finally... Uh, Take a look at the test track. So we have now gone up to a top speed of 128.7 miles an hour. And our weight distribution has become more front heavy because of that heavy V8 up front. Uh, let's go ahead and run our track time. And I'm pretty sure we're safe to assume that this is going to be a quicker time. So we have 1 minute 34.55 seconds, which is a pretty dramatic improvement, which I think we all expected. So let's finally jump into the last trim for the Nebula, and this is going to be a premium trim. So this is very similar to the other V8-powered uh, Nebula. It just has a premium uh, interior and entertainment system. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the uh, setup of the vehicle across the board. So uh, we now have a 0-62 to 62 time of 7.6 seconds, and a uh, we're getting... 13.7 miles per gallon rather than uh, the 14-ish that we were getting before. And again, we're going to have increased weight, which is a lot of the reason why that's happening. Tire setup is exactly the same, as is the brake setup. And I'm fairly certain we have more brake fade, which we would expect with increased weight, which we see here. Aerodynamics are going to be the same as they were with the other V8-powered uh, trim. And the interior is where we have the main difference. So we have premium interior and premium CD, but everything else is more or less the same. And the suspension might be slightly different as well because of increases in weight. Let's go ahead and take a look at our test track. So we're not quite as front heavy as we were before. Uh, I'm not sure if the top speed differed all that much, but we do know that it is slower 0 to 62 wise. Let's see what our time is like now. So we're now at 1 minute 35.27. So we can see that direct comparison here. So about 0.7 seconds 
a slower than we were before. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the project setup. So again, this is set up very similarly to the way that uh, previous uh, vehicles were set up. The focus we went with uh, this time is for a 50%, so more middle of the road. Because I figure that this is a little bit uh, more prestigious of a vehicle for us. Uh, especially as the uh, trend in popularity, we want to put a lot more focus into this, into expanding our knowledge of SUV development. And we had the same approach with the engines, although technically you could justify a 60% uh, focus here when you consider these are the same engines that are in the asteroid. But let's go ahead and move on nonetheless to our factory setup. So we have a large factory like we've had uh, with all of our other models thus far, minus the asteroid, which used a huge factory. The uh, factory setup, uh, we have 75 for automation, and we're trying to produce as many of these as we can. So our overall production comes in at 877 a day. And the distribution that I gave it was, uh, I figured that the uh, 3.6 uh, uh, liter V6 powered uh, all-wheel drive trim would be the most popular out of the bunch. It's It's got that all-wheel drive versatility, but it's the more affordable of the bunch with that V6 being a little bit cheaper than the V8 powered one. Then I thought that the next produced one would be uh, just the standard V6 without the all-wheel drive, again, because of affordability's sake. Then I figured the V8-powered one would be the next most popular, and then the premium one would be uh, the one that we would see the least uh, sales in, although there would still be a desirability for that. So with that in mind, I went with production for the engines to correspond with the production of the vehicles. So we have about 550 V6s. And we have about 327-ish, 320, we'll just say 330. We have 330 <laughs> V8s being produced. And uh, for that production, I did go with uh, uh, redu reduction in the shifts. So we have 2.2 shifts producing the V6s and 1.6 shifts producing the V8s because we don't need quite the same level production as we're getting with the uh, actual cars themselves. Okay, so let's go ahead and hop into uh, the overall market data. And we'll start over with the the base trim. I already discussed how the, uh, the price points of these vehicles, even with a 5% markup, is really not too realistic. Uh, an SUV costing $13,500, even in the mid-90s, is, is not really what you would see. Uh, but, you know... With that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at what markets that uh, we hit at the strongest. So we have family sport as our strongest category and family utility as our uh, one of our strong categories as well as the pony category. We always seem to do pretty well in the pony category for some reason or another, but the family utility category is definitely what we're going for. That's the uh, category that we are looking the most for, although utility sport would be another one that we would like to hit, which we didn't too do too bad in the standard utility sport category and family utility we did pretty decently as well we didn't really hit the uh family family utility budget market segment due to uh really poor affordability and i've already discussed how i feel like affordability also needs adjust because that doesn't seem like it's uh all that realistic either uh but uh, we do pretty well in family utility and family utility premium so let's go ahead and see uh, how we do with the all-wheel drive version and if there's any changes as a result. So we have changes, but not the kind of changes we would expect. So we have family sports still being our strongest category, but now we're performing uh, well again in the pony segment and the family premium, which is a new segment for us. We're still doing pretty well in utility sport, family utility, and uh, family utility premium which again these are the these categories here are the ones that we're really looking for uh but uh all right so let's jump into the v8 and see if anything changes with that
All right, so we definitely gone up in price a bit here, so we're going to expect uh, affordability to reflect that increase in price. But again, we're hitting the same market segments we were with the other all-wheel drive vehicle, but with the V6. Uh, we're hitting the family sport, the family premium, and the pony category. This time, the pony category being our strongest one because of that increased performance. But we're still hitting the utility sport, family utility, and family utility premium market segments decently enough. Let's now jump into the uh, the premium trim, which should be the most exper expensive variant we've seen so far. And this time, we've actually jumped around a little bit. We're now only performing well in two market segments rather than three. And uh, we have the family premium being our strongest one, which, you know, this is still a family-oriented vehicle. So I think that's okay to hit that market segment. But we're more looking for the family utility and utility sport. But we are doing well in the utility sport segment. And that's our second strongest market segment. Now, we dropped down quite a bit in the family utility market. And I'm going to assume a lot of that has to do with the uh, drop in affordability. Uh, family Utility Premium, we're not doing too bad in, and that's actually a really decent score. Pony Segment, we've dropped down quite a bit, and again, I think that's due to affordability. But we're also doing pretty well on City Premium, which is, I would say, our third best category, and we could have easily had a box around this one, uh, but for some reason we don't. And we're also doing well on Commuter Premium, which is definitely not a market segment where that we're necessarily going for as this is not really an economical long-distance traveling vehicle, in my mind, because of its poor fuel economy. But uh, we're still doing pretty well in the family sport uh, segment. Uh, so interesting uh, market uh, shares that we're getting here. But let's go ahead and just do a comparison now with the other models that we have so far. So we have the Asteroid Constellation the Luna, and the Star. I'm going to try to be a little bit more brief with this than I was in the past. Well, the one thing we're definitely seeing here is that the fact that the Nebula is the most drivable car out of all of the cars that we have. Even the rear-wheel drive version has the best drivability comparatively. The next best model is the, uh, the premium trim with uh of the star which is at 49 but uh, pretty much no other uh model comes anywhere close to the drivability of the nebula which is not necessarily something we were going for just something that we achieved as far as sporiness goes we definitely have more sporiness than the asteroid and i think a lot of that is due to the way we set up our suspension and different selections that we did make but we're definitely not performing quite as well as some of our other models for instance even the luna is equaling uh some of the uh trims and surpassing in some regards the trims of the uh nebula as far as comfort goes and this is actually a market segment that we're we're concerned about here we're not doing too bad i would uh for this vehicle i actually would look for similar performance to what we got with the star and i think in that regard we more or less met that uh that goal maybe slightly better but not quite as good as constellation but the constellation is all about comfort so that would have been a hard task to complete in any case moving on to uh prestige this is uh not too bad of a performer as far as prestige is concerned it definitely beats out the asteroid pretty much across the board uh, but doesn't quite reach the levels that the uh constellation achieves uh when you compare apples to apples uh, it's just a little bit uh, below that uh, those numbers, but not too far off. And then finally, safety. Uh, again, uh, we're doing better than the asteroid, and we're doing better than uh, the Luna and the Star, but not quite as good as the Constellation, which is, uh, I think, for the most part, a heavier vehicle. Uh, the only real exception to that is... Uh, here with the uh, premium trim of the Nebula. I mean, let's just check. If we compare apples to apples, standard trim with a V6 versus standard trim with a V6, it looks like the Constellation is typically heavier. Uh, but uh, moving along, uh, we have uh, Practicality here. And this is a strong performer here. And I have uh, a good feeling that that's, a lot of that has to do with the number of passengers we can carry. 
and we're outperforming our previous strong uh, model, the Luna, by quite a margin. So this is our most practical vehicle, which again, I think is success for us. That's exactly what we're looking for. As far as off-road ability goes, uh, we're doing better than pretty much every model except the Asteroid, which is going to be the strongest of all of our models. As far as utility goes, again, this is a strong performer. It's not quite as good as the Asteroid, but the Asteroid was all about utility, so uh, it would have been hard to compete with that. But we're doing better than all of the other uh, models, uh, the next best being the Constellation, which we outperform. As far as reliability goes, this is a fairly reliable vehicle. Uh, our worst performer is at 66, which is uh, equal to the worst performer of the star. And I think uh, the goals for the nebula kind of coincide with the goals for the star in some regards. We're trying to hit somewhat the same kind of market segments. The main thing that the nebula is trying to do is just be more practical and carry more passengers. But otherwise, it's meant for the same kind of person. Just somebody with a little bit more money, obviously. Now, fuel economy-wise, uh, we are not performing quite as well as the Constellation, but we're definitely performing better than the Asteroid. And we're not going to perform as well as the Star or the Luna, and I think that makes perfect sense uh, because of the differences in weight and a number of other things. And just like what we had with the Asteroid, uh, just because the Constellation is heavier doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get... Uh, worse fuel economy here a lot of this has to do with aerodynamics as well and the suv being a taller uh more blocky uh profile it's not going to have quite the the aerodynamic benefits that the constellation is as well as the under tray selection that we ma made as well um we already talked about weight uh, emissions wise i would say it's not quite as bad as the uh the asteroid but it's not too far off from that uh, production unit wise it uh, I would say it's comparable to the constellation uh, there's areas that it uh, is better and there's areas that it's worse for instance uh, it's uh, highest uh, trim is higher than the highest trim of the uh, constellation so uh, so it, it, it's it's pretty similar and the pricing is also, I would say, pretty similar. It goes up and down. Our most expensive trim is more expensive than the most expensive trim of the Constellation. But uh, we do have trims that are cheaper than the cheapest trim of the Constellation. So it goes kind of back and forth with that. And considering that I would think that these two trims would be some of the more... Uh, highly purchased trims. Uh, if we look at that trim then... I would say we're we're on the expensive end here with the uh, Nebula for sure. But SUVs tend to be expensive, so I don't think that's too far off of reality. In any case, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This is Mouse Gunner signing out.